G'day and welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. I'm Jason Edwards. And I'm Maddie Claire Sloan. Jace, you photographed someone for the first time this week. I did. I took a trip to the Blue Mountains National Park. Now, the weather was a little rough, sort of kicked me around a bit, but I managed to get a few good frames. What about you, Matt? Well, I had a chat with Megan Lewis. She told us some incredible stories of her experience living with the Maru people in a remote outback community. The photo behind us is the front cover of her book, Conversations with the Mole. I know this frame well. It's a great moment and very well executed. All this and more on today's episode of Snap Happy, the photography show. Megan Lewis is an award-winning documentary photographer and author. She has covered hundreds of news events locally and internationally. She is truly dedicated to her work. So much so that she spent years living in a remote Aboriginal community with the Mardu people. So Megan, how did you get started with photography? I think the seed was planted when I was a child because um, I used to spend a lot of time running around in the bush in New Zealand and I got my first camera when I was eight and uh, I had a pet rabbit and we decided to, to release it. It was a wild rabbit that we'd rescued when it was little and released it and I took pictures of it and I thought, hmm, I think I want to be a photographer. How did you transition from shooting your rabbit <laughs> into news? I got my first job first real job in a community newspaper in New Zealand and I was there for about 12 months and had a gut feeling that I needed to get on a plane and come to Australia. So I got on a plane and came to Australia and within a week of being here I got the job with Reuters. So I was there for four years shooting all manner of things, mostly sport and at the time I was only one of four women in the whole of Reuters around the world. You brought out this amazing book, Conversations with the Mob. Can you tell us about that? Well, I had been working in the media mm -hmm. at the time, but it's sort of if you jump back to when I was 16 yeah. and growing up in New Zealand, I had a dream and I had a dream that I was walking beside a tall black man and he was telling me about his problems and he said, do you think you can come and help us? And I said, yes, I think I can, but give me some time, I'm only 16. 16 years later, I was sitting in a river in the middle of the Western desert and opposite me was a, a tall black man and he said, you know that fella in the dream, that was me. So I spent two years building up a rapport with them and then eventually left the job, left the boyfriend and got in the vehicle and drove to the desert. <laughs> Went off. <laughs> yep. Do you have any favourite images or standout images that really have meaning, well they all have meaning behind them, but one that stands out for you? It's hard to pick a, a, a favourite or one that really stands yep. out because all the pictures come together to make the whole story. Yeah but there's a couple of poignant moments. The Aboriginal people in the, in the desert were nervous about having anyone photograph them mm. because they thought that Westerners are judging them. And in the end, Cecilia said, no, I trust you. It doesn't matter. This is how I live. Photograph yeah. me how I am. That would have been a rewarding moment for you as well. It was, yeah. yeah. And then there was more than that, the ones that go deeper, and that's around the grief. There's yeah. so much death out there and it was important to show what is really happening on the inside because most people, particularly in the surrounding uh, towns, only see the aftermath of the grief and that's the drunkenness. Yes. So in those moments when you're photographing something that's so sensitive, you have to be really careful of the way you handle it and have a, a great respect for them. As well, yeah. yeah. Now, did you find any challenges while living so remotely out there while pho like photographing this or was it just come so naturally to you? Well, I pretty much lived in the back of my car yep. for or every day you never knew where I was going to sleep and I had a swag and I lived I lived with the mob so I would I could yeah I could be in a house or I could be on the concrete on the veranda with them anywhere and yep. up to 60 degrees heat. You became like family to them anyway. Yeah, so. yeah it was hard living. It was yep. rough. Yep. Were you happy to come home or more sad to leave? I've never really left them because there's still my, there's yeah. so many people that I'm so connected to that are still on the phone to me every couple of weeks or, oh, and I go back out to a community on the edge of the desert. Have they seen the book? Yeah, they saw yeah. the book when it first came out. Are they amazed? Mixed reactions. It's like any community. Some people feel that, you know, it's, it, they're not happy. Others are really happy. Yeah. You can't please everyone. Yep, yeah, of course. So Megan, where to from here? What's next? Well, for the last couple of years, I've been working on a, a very personal project. I think sometimes we think we've got to go out and go long distances mm -hmm. and do big dramatic things in order to do something meaningful. Yeah. And during this time, my father had had three strokes and we thought we were going to lose him and he started to turn a corner. 
and he's had a lot of alternative therapy so I started documenting that Amazing. and his little journey and he's yeah. made an enormous recovery improvement yeah. so I've got a, just a really little personal story where he's exposing himself yeah. and he was happy to do it and I say exposing himself in the right <laughs> kind of way <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. one last question why documentary photography why was that the standout for you because it's a whole lot of pictures that give you an insight into other people's world. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, that sort of photography can reveal so much more. And if the, if the person who's perceiving those images or viewing those images can connect in some way with something in themselves, then it just really adds to the thread of life. Just west of Sydney is the World Heritage listed Blue Mountains National Park. It's well known for its spectacular landscapes, rugged terrain, sprawling forests, waterfalls and wildlife. I've never photographed here before and I'm really excited. The weather's turned a little nasty, but that doesn't mean we can't find some great imagery. So Jamie, what makes the Blue Mountains so unique? Well, it's spectacular. The views are absolutely beautiful, world class. I know I've lived here my whole life, I've worked here most of my life. I never tire of this view. Never ever get tired of this view. It's a very deep valley. It goes down 700 metres to the bottom of this valley. The cliffs are between two to 300 metres tall, all the way through here. And this is a tourist mecca, isn't it? People it is. from all over the world come It here. is, yes. We overtook Royal National Park last year with 4.3 million visitors. So now the most visited national park in Australia. Echo Point, right where we're standing here today, is the most visited single site in Australia <laughs> okay. by overseas visitors. Yes, and if you look at the view, yeah. we can see why. I'm always people watching. People are always doing interesting things, funny things. So if you see tourists or friends or total strangers doing something, don't be afraid to take a shot. Don't be insulting or invasive, but just step back and watch what's happening. You get a lot of great images that way. Super quick tip, don't hold the lens like this. Don't hold it like this. Get your hand underneath. It becomes much more stable that way. And then, you're not gonna drop your camera and your pictures will be sharper. I'm going down to visit Wentworth Falls. What can I expect there? Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful place. The waterfalls there are just spectacular. So apart from Echo Point being our most visited site, Wentworth Falls is our second. Okay. Really. It is that beautiful. Yeah. Really nice. The waterfalls are 90 metre drop, uh, always flowing. It never stops year round. Just in the last weeks, we didn't have any rain for six weeks. The waterfall was still flowing. Our unique hanging swamps are holding all that water back. So it's trickling out the bottom of the hanging swamps, also out of the sandstone, feeding that waterfall. It never dries up. It's always going. Beautiful place. The weather is hard to predict in the mountains. Today started off windy and wet, but the afternoon has brought out the sunshine. I'm standing at the highest elevation of Wentworth Falls. I've not been here before, so I'm starting my compositions right here. The falls drop for about 100 metres. As I work my way down, I'll take more and more images until I'm at the bottom looking up. When you're photographing and you have a lot of contrast in the scene, sun on trees, dark shadows in a gorge, you might need to use your exposure compensation just to level the picture out a little bit, adding or subtracting a little bit of light. This scene is great for what we call layering. It's where you use elements in the frame to create a sense of depth and put something interesting in different parts of the scene. We've got lots of shadows over the rolling mountain range here. So what I've been doing is using those shadows to create points of interest all the way back to the distant horizon. When photographing in bushland like this, it's easy to get caught up on the grandeur of the landscape. I always carry a macro lens with me and look for beauty in the little things. Don't get too concerned with filling the frame. Use other elements in the scene to create a composition. I deliberately blurred the flowers that were closest to me to highlight the beauty and delicacy of the flowers in the background. Mm -hmm. 
After a decent hike, I finally made it to the bottom of the falls. And what an impressive sight. It's always fantastic to shoot a large, impressive waterfall. But don't get fixated on that. Sometimes small waterfalls can make a much more beautiful image. Get down low, get in close. Vary your shutter speeds and your f-stop, your depth of field, to create an interesting composition. It's been a big day exploring the Blue Mountains. There's so much to capture here, and we definitely only scrape the surface. I know I'll be back here soon. Happy shooting. Hi, I'm Megan Lewis, and I'm a documentary photographer, and this is what's in my kit. I have an X-Pro2 Fujifilm, which is a beautiful camera with, um, I've got a 23mm lens on this camera, which is a 1.4. I use this for documentary. I have a X-T100, which is a fantastic little camera, it takes beautiful shots. Um, the lens is fixed, 23. When you don't want to carry much, you're traveling, um, I have it, I can just put it in a bum bag and I can do documentary shots with this street photography. It's a really handy camera for pretty much all occasions. The next camera is the X-T, I have the X-T1, the X-T2. I can cross it over into documentary, but I also use it for commercial work. I have a 16 to 55 mil on this camera, so that when I'm in um, situations where I can't move forward into the shot, I can either zoom in or zoom out. Um, and it's great for commercial shooting. I also carry whew, a few batteries, so to make sure I've always got spe uh, ones that are charged and backed up. SD cards, which uh, I carry in a waterproof container. And for the times that I need a little light, and just in a light kit, I'll just use this little, little light here. I'm Megan Lewis, and this is what's in my kit. Whether you just want to have some fun with your digital photos, or you want to get down to some serious editing, Wacom offer a range of products to help you improve your workflow, and to make work a little bit more comfortable. So Simon, tell us what Wacom's all about. So Wacom's been the world leader in digital pens for the last 30 plus years, but Wacom built their name on graphics tablets, or they're also known as pen tablets. So essentially what you've got is a batteryless, uh, pressure sensitive pen that you can use to control your favorite creative software. So you can use it anywhere that you would ordinarily use a mouse. And now we have a huge range behind us here. Shall we go check them out? Let's check it out. <laughs> So this is our Intuos Photo. Um, it's a great entry-level tablet. It's kind of a perfect starting point for anyone looking to start retouching photos. And the major advantage of this tablet is it comes with everything you need right out of the box to start awesome. editing photos. We've got a small black area. This is what we call our active area. Yep. It represents your whole computer screen. So if I pick up the pen and I go to the top left-hand corner of my tablet, I'm in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Okay. That's kind of the hardest thing to get used to. As soon as you've got that, you understand this product completely. So you're using your hand as well as the pen, like yeah, the mouse? Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I can use touch to navigate okay. the computer, start to open up programs, zoom in, zoom out, rotate gestures, all those kind of things. Yeah. Another feature of the tablet is it's obviously got uh, four express keys on it. So we can set these up to do shortcuts um, in any piece of software. So uh, mm -hmm. I might set it to do undo because I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> so it's always good to have that one set up ready yeah. to go. <laughs> So what we're looking at here is the Intuos Pro. Okay. Um, specifically, this is the large model, so it comes in a, a small, medium, and a large. Mm -hmm. The major differences, beside the size, yep. this one is twice as sensitive, so it just means it's, it's a lot nicer to use. It's a lot more responsive. It'll operate with the, the faintest touch on the tablet, yep. and you can start to see a response from the software. Okay, so we've got an all-in-one here. That's right. Yep. That's right. So this is the Cintiq Companion 2. Um, so this is an ideal device for anyone that needs mobility. Mm -hmm. It's got touch screen, so it's got 10 finger multi-touch built into the screen, but it's actually a standalone computer and run all of your creative software that you would normally edit with. This is the biggest one in the range. 
Yes, it is. What are we looking at here? So this is the Cintiq 27. Mm -hmm. um, it comes in a touch and a non-touch model, depending on whether you want the ability to kind of work on your Im images with, with hand gestures as mm -hmm. well. It's a 97% Adobe RGB color space, which means this is ideal for people with color critical workflows. Okay. So um, some uh, photo retouchers and photographers need to know that the image that they've got on screen is going to be reproduced exactly when they print it. Uh, and for that reason, they'll use some kind of color management device um, just to make sure they're getting the most accurate color possible. This one comes with a portable express key, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, this allows us to kind of choose a more comfortable way to work, just like we can change the angle of the screen. Okay. We can kind of choose where we want those express keys to sit while we're working. So it'll kind of stick to the screen magnetized and then uh, similar to the Intuos Pro we've got a, a touch ring so we've got three stages on that that we can use to scroll in zoom and so forth. What other sizes does it come in? The Cintiq comes in a range of sizes starting from 13 inch full HD and then we move up to the Cintiq 22 which again is full HD and it's a slightly smaller form factor than this 27 here so it's, it's a smaller stand it's very popular with people that desk space is important okay. uh, and they can't quite afford to have something quite this large yeah. uh, taking up so much space on their desk. Beautiful well thanks so much for chatting with us Simon. On Snap Happy we've spoken to a lot of photographers and we're finding more and more of them are using the Wacom products. Let's go find out why. I use a Wacom graphics tablet so that I can accurately draw and cut out. It's a lot of refining, it's a lot of sort of light painting and uh, bringing shadows and highlights in where I need and sometimes some little magical particles and things like that. But you know, I, I'm creating an artwork. And that's what's great about using the Wacom is that, you know, it's actually like painting. And if you gave me a, like a, a brush and a canvas, I wouldn't be able to create anything. <laughs> but like, you know, because it's like an image and I can actually paint straight or yeah. on, um, I can actually get to the areas and really communicate the story they want to share with people. You have no idea. I love my Wacom, so I have this one at my office and I also have one at home. Yep. But I haven't owned emails for, I don't know, for well over five or six years now. So it's just an amazing piece of equipment. It's not That's only amazing. faster, it's just a lot more precise too. Watching you do it before, I'm like, you just got the knack of it. You can do everything. You're scrolling, you're adding things here yeah, and there. So you can do everything. Well, there you go. Maybe I should take Jade's advice and trade in my mouse for a Wacom tablet. Thank you. We've pulled up on the side of the road in the middle of the night. A farmer's burning off a whole bunch of dead trees and timber. You just don't know what you're going to get with a long exposure. Number one thing, be careful. It's a fire. You don't want to get burnt. But at the same point in time, we've got the moon coming up behind the embers and uh, it's quite spectacular. A bit volcanic in the images, I think. So I'm standing under the ember chimney coming out of this burning pile of dead trees. There's a lot of ash raining down, but it really might give me a, a different perspective on, you know, what's happening in the sky here with the, with the moon. And yeah, wow, that's quite interesting. <laughs> Problem with doing this sort of stuff, it's just endless. Every frame's completely different to the frame before. So, you know, Above everything, be careful, but also just uh, try and make an image out of what's happening in the sky. I can't believe I'm encouraging people to go around photographing fires in the middle of the night, lit by total strangers. The only way to really capture something like this is to use a tripod and either the self-timer on the camera or I'm using an electronic cable release. It means that if I have any of the timber in the foreground, it's going to be sharp because there's no camera shake. But it also enables me to leave the shutter open for a long time and get the streams of the embers as they fly up into the night sky. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, that's going up. Safety first, children. So Megan, being a documentary and street photographer, I would find it very intimidating to walk up and get close and personal with someone that, I'm, that I don't really know. What's a tip that you can give us um, how to build a rapport with someone? Well, like the key word you said is rapport. Yeah. So 
if you don't have rapport, no matter how technically good your pictures yeah. are, there, it's, it, there's not going to be the essence with those with the story. Yeah. I'm essentially a very shy person, and I'm also very respectful, and I, I don't want to intrude on other people's privacy. Yeah. So if I'm going to photograph people that, uh, and, and particularly vulnerable people, I take time to to build up a trust with them. They have to trust me. I've got to know them, so I take time. It's just it's really building up a friendship. Yeah. And I will take the camera with me. I may take pictures that I know aren't that good, but just to get people familiar with the process, mm. I will show them what I take um, and just take it from there and, 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 and feel my way through it. When it comes to street photography, how would you take on that? Some people can just walk around the street and, and feel very comfortable and, and seeing a scene and taking pictures. And you can get some really good shots. If you're a shy person, I'd suggest to just find a place where you think it's interesting, where people are walking by, mm -hmm. sit down or lean against a pole and just quietly take shots of people walking past and just see what you come up with. Yeah, and when it comes to editorial and capturing a portrait and they're quite shy or their personalities are not shining through, is there something that you do to bring it out? I practice being really present in myself. Yep. Same thing, you, some, quite often you have to photograph someone and you, you do have a limited time, mm -hmm. but you can sort of make that time a long time if you're really engaged with that person. I think make conversation with them, but not being authentic, not false stuff. You, mm -hmm. At the same time, you're looking to where you can set the shot up, how you can do stuff, yep. but I find time to talk to that person, I observe their body language so that when I pose them, I'm posing them in a way that's more natural to them. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Megan. I might try those out. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll see how I go. And thanks so much for coming on Snap Happy. <laughs> Jace, it looked like you had fun in the Blue Mountains. I had a great time. We should go back there soon and do a shoot together. I will hold you to that. Each week we throw a spotlight on one of the products from the Snapfish range. Mads, what are we looking at this week? This week we're taking a look at the canvas prints. Now they come in a variety of different sizes and a premium and framed option as well. I've printed several of my images onto canvas, which is a great way to display them at home. The canvas really gives the photography a feel of art. I couldn't agree more, Jace. As well as printing my photo books, I also like to pick one or two photos to get printed out in canvas. Now it is a hard job to do, but it must be done. If you'd like to join our community, go to our website at snaphappytv.com where you'll see exclusive content, competitions and special offers from our partners. We'll see you next week on Snap Happy, the photography show. The problem with hiking shirts is they're not great for cleaning lenses. The cotton underwear is.